Please welcome your panelists for Common Sense from Uncommon Investors, moderated by Michael Milken. Well, good afternoon. It's May 1st, 2018. Uh, and we have five of the world's greatest investors joining us today. And our theories for this panel were, what are the insights, their professional lives, some of the ideas, how do they approach making decisions at their institutions? And I thought we'd give you a quick little pass down the panel here on why they went into the investment business. Mitch, Mitch Jewis Canyon. Um, was a lawyer, and uh, it wasn't challenging enough. Uh, so I wrote a few articles in LA Magazine. I interviewed somebody at Drexel by the name of Henry Wolf, and Henry said, uh, we should be interviewing you for a job, and they in introduced me to Lowell and Mike, and uh, I got to uh, do what I always wanted to do, which was to apply the law and finance to restructurings of all kinds. And in addition, was able, because Drexel was that kind of place, bring out uh, some of my closest uh, colleagues, Josh Friedman, who eventually became my partner at Canyon. All right, George Hicks, Barney Partners. Well, I was a lawyer as well, and... Uh, so we see a little train yeah. here. <laughs> I think you're setting it up there, but uh, I, what I noticed was that when, when there was a deal closing, or you negotiated all day, uh, the, the business guys and gals, they got to go home and the lawyers had to stay up all night drafting. So I said, I got to get on the other side of right. this business somehow. <laughs> so I had a chance to uh, build a portfolio uh, at that time for Cargill. And it was right about the point in time that we, we had the big default cycle in about 1990 and the Resolution Trust Corporation came into being selling off a lot of assets. Uh, so I guess it was a bit the uh, right place at the right time. Uh, and that's how I got into the business. Well, one of the reasons, George, as you know, lawyers work all night is they get paid by the hour. So whether they're working exactly. or <laughs> sleeping, they're working all night. Man, well, I was 15 years old. My father uh, let me take $500 to buy AT&T shares. I looked at the newspaper on the way down to broker-dealer uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina. I saw a little blurb about Kent cigarettes and P. Larlard, and I decided to buy 10 shares of P. Larlard. The next day, I got on a bus and got off in the 2 o'clock at night in Norfolk, Virginia. I got the newspaper. I wanted to see how I was doing, and the stock was up 2 and 5 eighths. And I could feel my heart beating inside <laughs> of my chest. And I knew from that time on, the only thing I ever wanted to do was to be in the market. That's interesting, Manny. My uncle, who was the chairman of the board of Hart, Shafter, and Marks in Chicago when I was 13, gave me a few shares of Hart, Shafter, and Marks. I think he never regretted it because I constantly called him and discussed how the company was doing, didn't like what management decisions were, <laughs> et cetera. So, uh, John, what about yourself? Yeah, so I have a, a little different story. I was actually pre-med at Cal, and uh, I had an accident and ended up in the, uh, in the emergency room. I broke my leg in a soccer game, and I was there for three hours before they could x-ray me, at the end of which it was, well, why would anybody want to be a doctor? So at that <laughs> point, I came back a, a, a econ major, and the rest is history. All right. Mark? Well, I, too, was a lawyer, and... Uh, <laughs> the, short, the short answer is I found it too boring, although apologies mm -hmm. to the many talented attorneys in the room. Uh, the better answer is I wanted to get closer to the heart of what was happening, whether it was a financing or a merger transaction. And I had the very good fortune uh, to interview and get a job offer at Solomon Brothers in New York. Uh, some of you may recall, was uh, actually became somewhat prominent, among other things, uh, for being the subject of a book, Liar's Poker. And in those days, uh, Mike was a little bit competitive with the guys at Solly. And uh, I did very 
difficult time getting attention from Drexel, and the second I get that Solomon Brothers offer, an offer from Drexel a week later, they would not let me leave the Beverly Hills office till I committed. And here we are. That must have been the corporate finance department, <laughs> not the gentleman's in the trading <laughs> area. So, you know, we have three of our panel members particularly that have expertise in non-investment grade debt. And uh, we have a short video of some of the requirements, so we're going to talk about their activities, some of what you need to do if you're going to handle a non-investment grade portfolio. So let's take a look at this video. A weatherproof jumpsuit to protect against investor fallout. Protective boots for sticky deals. Sensitive gloves for handling delicate transactions. State-of-the-art electronics for tracking changes in the marketplace. Handling a junk bond portfolio requires special equipment, the kind of things that don't come off the rack. We're the professionals. When it comes to trading junk bonds, our services are tailor-made. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Mitch, if we walked into Canyon, uh, how are the people on your trading desk dressed these days? Huh? Dressed? Well, look, uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, debt is toxic or, you know, <laughs> the kind of debt that we talked about and raise money uh, during the 80s for and then transition into the 90s and now the next century. It's, it's challenging because it's complex, and, and that's like one of the common sense themes that I think we're, we're going to be talking about, which is there are opportunities in any situation which is complex, and when you're looking at securities, you're di designing securities that are complex, you can find a lot of beauty as opposed to toxicity in the situation, right? And uh, so I would say that when you walked on the floor of Canyon, you'd find... 50 professionals that are going over indentures, uh, really trying to understand the process, the fundamentals of companies, uh, either buying securities that people and institutions don't want or designing securities as we did when we were at Drexel uh, that solves a problem for the company and also provides an opportunity for our investors. So it's this by complexity and self simplicity idea that's been around um, for a while that really is the basic common sense theme that we embrace. Now, look, to some people, complexity is threatening and they like to envelop themselves in the false comfort of simplicity. We see that-, that Must be the PE guys, huh? Yeah, well, that, well, I mean, we have charts on the flow of money into uh, ETFs, et cetera, et cetera, index funds, and I'm not knocking that approach to investing, um, but alternatives by their very nature are com complex. And Why don't we uh, take a look at slide 16 and maybe took a, take a look at your decision process there, if we could pull that up, Mitch. Yeah. So if you look at what we try to do at, at Canyon, and I think this is common to most other firms that are in the alternative space is you have to have a worldview and a research process that's congruent in a corporate culture. And one of the best ways to bring them all together is what I think is a systems approach, which is you, it's, it's no magic to it. It's basically saying, you know, the world is complex, getting more complex. You should embrace that complexity by looking how, how things are interconnected and always understand and have the humility to understand that there's always unintended consequences, unknown unknowns. So you always try to balance preparation, prediction, and build staying power in your portfolio, not just earnings power. And that allows you to stay in the game when others are taken out, so you can buy things when others have to sell. And I, I think George would tell you, and Mark, and Manny, and John, that that's pretty common to what we do, because when you buy complex situations, you have to most importantly, always be around when things get tough. And going back to your toxic, uh, you know, little film from our days at Drexel when we did those kind of things, look, when things get really tough in the marketplace, when there's this kind of uh, fear that it, that's what's really toxic. It's not the investments themselves, it's the fear that envelops them that you have to be able to withstand by having the staying power. 
So I, I think three of our panelists uh, particularly have the flexibility, and maybe in some sense all of them, to participate anywhere in the capital structure uh, if they choose to. George, talk to us a little bit about the process at Varde. So uh, I think a, a big thing is I think about our team. We, we don't happen to be dressed up in those nice suits uh, when we go to work, but I think the, the big difference is, is that we have a team spread around the world that's interconnected. We have 90 investment professionals uh, spread almost equally between the U.S., London, and uh, Singapore. Uh, we connect regularly, and, and I think uh, an important piece of that is that it brings a diverse set of views to bear as, as we both determine relative value and, and find opportunities. And so it, it, it takes a lot of work because those time zones don't match up perfectly. Uh, and we try to set up some rules of the road so everybody gets punished by, by the late night sessions. Uh, but process is so important and diverse viewpoints are so important because all of those perspectives come together uh, to ensure better decision making and that you've thought about all the risks. So t let's take a look at that uh, slide two for a moment, see if maybe you could comment on that a little bit, George, as we reflect on what those different cycles are as you step back. Well, what, the point we're making here is uh, actually uh, to disagree uh, and put it in a little different perspective because we don't think there is a single uh, cycle. And, and th there might be a bit of a unified uh, cycle, but our thought is, is that as you look around the world, there's always a different set of opportunities and cycles playing out at different points in time. I mean, you have economies in different stages, uh, and then importantly, you have uh, holders of cuspy debt in different states of mind as to when they're gonna sell those assets. Uh, and um, one of the things that we've found is, is that sellers of the assets that create the opportunities often go through uh, uh, kind of like the uh, stages of grief. Uh, you know, it's first it's, it's denial, uh, then it's acceptance, and then it's finally selling those assets. So. I think a, a central tenet for us in having built a, a global platform uniform is that there isn't a single credit cycle. And, and frankly, sometimes there's, there's too much of a preoccupation of, with what's going on in the U.S. In, in our credit cycle. Let's pull up that slide, too, just for a moment, George. And one of the points I would make to you and the other panelists is looking at these leverage ratios independent from the level of interest rates you know, is real, really impossible to do. Yep. Uh, when they want to loan you money for one basis point or 10 basis points uh, in Germany, it's pretty hard not to want to borrow. And so we don't know if that's a liability or an asset long term from that standpoint. So I think that's the point you were making. There's so many factors. George, one of the other areas that's somewhat unique to your firm is that you operate investments significantly in so many different countries so many different potential rule of law situations, jurisdiction. Uh, how do you handle that? Well, it is a, a critical underpinning when you're a, a credit-related investor because if you don't have a good rule of law and a way that it's enforced, uh, what appears to be a, a credit instrument with good downside protection uh, is not even close to that. And the big thing for us, uh, we, we talk about uh, local presence, local language, speakers, and as, as well as either partners or a presence on the ground. Uh, so a case in point, uh, we've been fairly active in Italy. Uh, lots of times you can talk about Italy as maybe not having the rule of law, a process that, that you might like to see. It can be a bit slow. Uh, and there's some truth to that, which you can factor in. But importantly for us, as, as in any country we go into, uh, we have local Italian speakers, uh, we make sure we understand the law, we read all those indentures that, that Mitch was talking about, even though they're in Italian, and then we have a local presence so that when, when you have to work out a deal, uh, we can do it with a, a local cultural presence. And the fact of the matter is, is that as you go to different countries, some of them don't have that predictability in the rule of law you need to invest for our type of investing, and, and we'll just simply have to avoid those jurisdictions. So, Mark, you have um, looked heavily in your firm in mezzanine, structured, uh, debt with equity, et cetera, is, is a combination. Uh, and 
I think with so many different opportunities, you've had to be pretty selective on which things you choose to invest in and what you don't. Talk to us a little bit about the process at Crescent. So, uh, you know, at Crescent now for 27 years with uh, my partner Jean-Marc Chappas, who really pioneered, I feel, sponsored mezzanine investing in the United States. Uh, we really focused on uh, people, process, and uh, selectivity uh, leading to performance. Uh, it's important, and Mike, we talked about this at Crescent, it's not just me and Jean-Marc, we've got a, a team of 80 investors. We have a, a slide here that indicates, you know, we've, over the last few years, we've looked at over 9,000 transactions. Um, we cover over 800 private equity firms, and for the panel preceding this, um, including uh, with John Donockel's partner, John Sokoloff, it seems like it's still a robust time for private equity. And, and yet, with that and the number of multiple transactions with sponsors, you can see we have uh, over 60 sponsors we've done transactions with. It's still extremely important to be selective. If you're, if you're selective and disciplined, you, uh, that can lead to a good result. Uh, typically, we will look at 1,300 to 1,500 transactions a year to make 30 investments and hope to get performance from those investments. And Mike, as you know, I, uh, I also am the uh, principal owner of the Milwaukee Brewers baseball team, and I've tried to take <laughs> things I've learned from uh, business and investing to baseball and vice versa. And uh, we find selectivity is important in baseball also. Uh, and it's a quick video that... Uh, okay, let's take a look at how you run your that. baseball team. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have quite as spirited a uh, celebration. We have a successful investment exit at Crescent. <laughs> but uh, you know, that one of our players, Jesus Aguilar, saw 13 pitches there in a single at bat. <laughs> 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 now, that's what John does when we ask him for a covenant in, in one of his deals. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you know, selectivity is so important in, in, in discipline in everything we do. And, uh, you know, that carries, uh, I think that carries through. Uh, Mark, I, I think one of the, you started with management. And um, I think it's something we've really focused on, whether it was in government, in a country, or whether it was a uh, person in the Senate, the House, uh, Prime Minister, anywhere in the world, or whether it's individuals managing a business. What are you looking for when you're looking at management? How are you attempting to judge management? Well, one of the, the key things we look at is, is uh, previous track record. It's not, it, as we know from an investment manager standpoint, it's not always indicative of future performance. But I think with folks who have demonstrated aptitude in running uh, companies, especially companies with debt, um, they can do it time and again. And, and in, in particular, not only the management team, but the, trans, the private equity sponsors. Um, we evaluate not only the PE sponsors and, and their well, their performance now is a matter of record, but the partner at the particular firm and how, uh, how their uh, transactions perform. And uh, we have a lot of investments, not only with re repeat PE sponsors, but with repeat management teams. So many, uh, in many ways, you developed, you financed at your firm, you built financial institutions that have uh, provided capital to people, particularly throughout this country. Uh, today, you're probably the most knowledgeable money manager investing in financial institutions, particularly banks. How did you choose this area uh, to focus on? Uh, first, I was a, uh, in 1972, I started with oil and gas. I. Uh, you know, I had this thirst for knowledge in the market and uh, uh, was successful over a very brief time. And then uh, oil and gas broke after the Yom Kippur War three or four years later. 
And then I tried to do casino stocks as an analyst. And uh, there was only eight or nine companies. So I, I apologize. I, it took me a while to get going away. there. And <laughs> I didn't give you enough of them to invest in. Yeah, them. so I, uh, <laughs> I <clears throat> couldn't break through because there were uh, so few companies. So finally, I found savings loans in banks. And at that time, there were 10,000 of them. So it didn't matter. Uh, if eight, if Mr. Jones followed, uh, uh, you know, first fed of charter, then I had 12 other pieces of fo to follow. So I needed, I had finally found a break in the market where there was tremendous inefficiencies because there wasn't coverage, and that's what I was looking for, and. You know, that gave me the break to go into financials simply because there were thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So I could be an expert in some group of them. Okay, let's talk about evolution from analyst, evolution from financing, Buildium, to evolution of one of the leading managers of financial institutions in the world as an investor. You know, this group is, uh, you know, is a relative, somewhat dull group, but it has uh, tremendous volatility in spurts, tremendous changes. It's tied very, very much to the regulatory environment. And so, in a sense, to get really good returns in this group, you need either chaos uh, like you had in 08, 09, or what you had in other uh, breaks earlier, or you need massive regulatory change uh, which, for the way you're having it right now. And because there's so many thousands of institutions, and also because there's different waves operating against each other, meaning shadow banking against banking, uh, and you have banking in different areas of the world, uh, you just have to simply adjust to the waves which move one way and then the other way, and also adjust to the unbelievably uh, complex regulatory governmental change because this is a regulated business. So to some extent, the government sometimes is picking the winners and the losers, period. So Manny, probably, I. <clears throat> More than anyone in the world, you had identified the small or medium-sized bank as an opportunity. Probably knew more about them at your firm than people running the bank themselves. And my view is the call from you to that CEO was probably the best thing the banker uh, running that business has with your insight across it. What led you to this sector of the market? Uh, we're agnostic as a firm, and so we don't care whether we're in Europe, we don't care whether we're long or short, uh, we don't care whether we're in the shadow bank space or in the big bank space or in the small bank space. We don't care whether we're in the debt or in the equity, period. Uh, we're just looking for the highest return in a rapidly changing group. And we're, we're here because this is the highest return anyone has seen in a long, long time, especially risk adjusted. So what's happened today is there are 5,000 banks in the United States. The Federal Reserve Board, because of cybersecurity uh, fears and also for political reason, has starting two years ago has made a decision to make the playing field completely unlevel. It's like owning a 7-Eleven where the 7-Eleven can be open all the time and the supermarket has to close at six o'clock every night and is closed on the weekends and can't sell liquor. Well, you're gonna make money in a 7-Eleven. So a small bank has an unbelievable advantage over uh, all, for the very, very large banks Keep in mind that 10 large banks have 75% of the market. And once they made this decision, we saw this as a very, very powerful opportunity. And that simply has accelerated 
because of the misconception in banking uh, in terms of the yield curve being a major factor. Mike tells me they all have 30-year mortgages, and that's a risk. That means he simply doesn't understand banking today. That's uh, why I invest <laughs> with you, Manny. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and they're actually basically have deposits at 30, 40 basis point zero, and they're lending out at LIBOR, and they're growing at 8%, and they're consolidating. And so, and the capital market window has opened up to all the private banks, all the uh, banks across the board. The uh, Federal Reserve Board has made rules that are quite uh, favorable. Give us one or two examples uh, of those rules that favor the small and medium. Fine. Subject counts as equity. That's like you going out and getting a mortgage at a house <laughs> and your equity just went up by $100,000 or a million dollars or ten million dollars if it's Mike's house. So, so, or twenty million or forty million. So, so, so that is an unbelievable rule and that's just a rule to allow me or have George buy me up because if, they, if George can borrow money at six percent counts as equity then he's first fed of Pulaski, Missouri and I'm second fed of Pulaski, Missouri. I finally can sell out to him and he closes the branches, consolidates, it's a tremendous return. So the consolidation is mind-boggling what's taking place, and we now have gasoline being thrown on the fire. We finally have a consolidation. Uh, we have a bill in Congress which is, should pass by Memorial Day, which makes these rules even more favorable. Thank you. So, um, John, I don't think you had a chance to come to lunch yesterday this fantastic lunch we had with a great moderator uh, yesterday at lunch. I know, I was uh, put on the standby list. I uh, couldn't believe I, it. Well, <laughs> but I want to show you a short clip from that lunch, if I could. Okay. General Petraeus, now remember, he had led the CIA, led much of the world in protection and military and the kind of in the Middle East, Africa, parts of Europe, et cetera had a stellar career in these areas. And yesterday on the panel, John, he pointed out, let's take a look. As a partner now in the global financial investment firm KKR, I have come to realize that beyond government service, the highest calling of mankind is the private equity industry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, for a person that graduated first in his class, <laughs> led our efforts around the world, uh, we appreciate that insight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to emphasize that with that comes enormous responsibility date for private equity. They control more than 8,000 firms. In the United States today, there are seven of the ten largest employers, and with that economic power comes enormous responsibility for the jobs of the citizens of, of not only our country, but the countries of the world. So you've taken on a lot more responsibility there too. Well, and in, and in a serious note, we, no kidding, seriously try to do well while doing good, uh, both because of, if you will, the moral nature of that, but also frankly, the practical nature. And for what it's worth, we are actually raising our first impact uh, investment fund where we're going to turn it around and do good while still hopefully doing well. So John, among the members of the panel, you look like you followed, according to General Petraeus, the highest calling going into private equity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, did you look at it that way when you made that decision? Well, I would say two things. First off, uh, one is I think he understates the case. I think, <laughs> it's, and the second is you had very cool socks. I, I really like those socks. Uh, in that, uh, look, it, it, it is a, it is a an important thing we do. Um, it's certainly not the most important thing, but uh, our job is to guarantee or provide for the retirements for our clients. Uh, many, m most of them would be uh, retirement accounts. So it's our job to make sure that the firemen, the policemen, the teachers, 
the promises that have been made to them during their career are, are, are honored. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you an interesting story. I was, um, I had, a, I had a benefit of going down to Houston to visit the Houston firefighters, one of our clients. And uh, I, I, I was there early and I walked around the uh, lobby and they had this wonderful display, an old fire engine, which was kind of cool. And they had these um, cubbies and the cubbies had the um, helmets for Houston firemen who had lost their, their lives in the line of duty. And it was an interesting, you, you sort of looked at it and it started in 1898 and then as it kind of got, it was, you know, Irish guys actually, and as it, as it sort of, the years went on, you saw, saw bad days where they lost three or four firemen, you saw Hispanic names, you saw female names. It was sort of an interesting sort of commentary. So I went into the meeting and I, and I, uh, they, they said, well, we're, you know, we're in a hurry, could you just, and so I said, yeah, and I said, thank you, and I sort of went through the story I went with you. And one of the trustees, he turned to me, put his hand on me, and, and he actually had tears in his eyes and says, that's why you can't blow it for us. And it was, um, it was a very moving moment for me, a very meaningful moment for me, and uh, a very special moment. So, you know, look at the, the folks that are getting it done are the people who run the businesses. Uh, we're allocating capital, we're making bets, we're hopefully adding value, um, hopefully not over adding value. But, um, you know, I would say um, maybe to use, uh, we're more the coaches and they're the players and both are important. So John, there's, we've gone through an interesting cycle in private equity. Mm -hmm. More money being raised than ever before. Your ability, due to lack of covenants, to dividend money out. Yeah. Uh, higher levels of leverage today. Um, that's occurred in the industry. How have you approached investing in this period of time? Okay, well, it's a broad question, and I think there was an hour on this before at the, uh, at, the, at the presentation before, but, you know, Warren Buffett said investing is simple. It's not easy, but it's simple, and, and it, I think it's a, a very apt statement. There's sort of three ways to make money in, in, in private equity. One is you buy things, and later multiples expand. The second is you buy things and you add value, or the third is you buy things with momentum and you ride the momentum for long enough and you make money. Those are sort of the three ways to do it. And the point you probably add is financial engineering, which, which, which certainly is a part, of, a part of it. But, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the joys of working with Mike, and, you know, we talk about uncommon investors, there is a common thread. Four of us worked with Mike, four of us worked at Drexel Burnham with Mike. And what was great was it was this opportunity to look at a lot of different buyout firms. That was our client base and see who was good, who was not good, who would, who would work for you. And then as you get in the business, there's pattern recognition. So what works for us is, is we, we, we first of all take the mandate seriously, which is to put a dollar to work and return two dollars net or more five years later. And the, and the uh, tactic or the strategy that we use to do that is essentially to buy growth. And, you know, you have a slide up there that talks about um, dry powder. I would say that I, it doesn't concern me at all. Uh, and one reason is look at what we're competing against. Okay, so what do, what do people like investing in today? They like investing in exchange traded funds. Okay, the S&P 500 today is trading at about 14 times EBITDA, okay? Our industry is buying, last count, 11, 12 times EBITDA. So we are buying, the spread is the highest it's been versus the public market in the last decade. So that's an area of opportunity. A second area of opportunity is growth. So the average growth over the last four years, compounded annual growth for the S&P 500 is shockingly 3.4%, 3.4%. Now that's way down, there's some oil and gas that's gone the wrong way, there's some large companies that are disproportionate um, but relative to the size of the EBITDA they contribute. But as I think my partner said in the earlier, the companies that we've bought in Fund 7 for the last four years have grown 19%, compound annual growth. So we're buying them basically today at about the multiple 
that the S&P trades at. Uh, we are growing, they're better companies, we're growing faster. We employ leverage that they can't employ. And so relative to alternatives, I would say that our asset class and certainly the types of assets that, that, um, the, that, that, that we're looking for, there isn't a doubt in my mind that we will outperform that index, not one. So Mitch, I wanna take you um, back here just thinking about maybe a specific situation where the flexibility that you built in to operate anywhere in the capital structure. So we have looked recently to try to test the thesis, which leads, does the bond market lead, does the equity market lead uh, in, as the first indicator? And some of the interesting things we've seen is that stock of a company could be going down and the bonds going up where the bonds are moving into higher probability that they'll get to own the company. Mm -hmm. You've had a few situations over time where you started out as a creditor or you even invested as a creditor where you were investing, looking at as if you were gonna buy the company. Could right. you pick an example maybe to relate that to? So I'll give you two examples of uh, situations that we're, uh, we've been involved with, but first I will make a more general point that I think speaks to some of the things that the group has touched upon different ways. So if you can put up slide 18. This is a very simple depiction um, of the structural opportunity I think we all face uh, today in the alternative space. So what this simply says, that in a complex world where you're dealing with a lot of the themes from this conference, the disruption, the disintermediation that is going on that arguably represents the way the world progresses, right? We think that social and physical technology, for the most part, will eventually get us to the right place, and this conference is about coming up with solutions to make that the case. So corporations, think about it, corporations are beset by these kinds of challenges. And as a result, they're trying to figure out what to do that with their balance sheet. Should we be public? Should we be private? Should we raise debt? Should we issue equity? Should we consider hybrids like converts? Should we transform our company uh, in a very step function like way? Like a content company, AT&T buying, excuse me, a distribu distribution company like AT&T buying a, com a, a content company like Time Warner to be able to compete with the Facebooks, Googles, Netflix of the world. So on the left side of this, you basically say an you see an increasing amount of balance sheet change. And usually, you d uh, capital is necessary in one form or another to deal with that. And certainly, secondary market securities are usually beset by these kinds of changes because the market doesn't always understand them. The regulatory overhang, and you see this bouncing around. Now, the capital to facilitate that change is less because the amount of balance sheet capacity that was usually provided by the money center banks has been compressed because of regulation, litigation. So as a result, people in the alternative space, whether any one of us on this panel have an opportunity to fill in those holes in the system and facilitate all the balance sheet change that corporations and other types of structured vehicles are going through. That's a structural opportunity that will last for the next five, 10 years, if not longer. Now, apply that to two situations, slide 37 first. This is what was the Caesar situation on your left. Um, in the, in the more complex boxes, and what it became as a result of deleveraging. Here was a company that was bought, bought in, a, in a private equity transaction, an excellent gaming company, excellent franchise. It was highly levered going into 2008. Boom, we hit a recession, and they can't grow into their balance sheet. So and, what to do? Mitch, I think we should point out, due to lack of covenants, this was a company that was uh, Harris rated investment grade. So the creditors that were investing in this company were investment grade that, at that time. And then there was a whole bunch of securities that were issued to, and debt securities that were issued 
Holco, Opco level um, to be able to finance this, th this situation. And with the recession from the great financial recession, it couldn't grow into that leverage. So as a result, Canyon and others bought securities up and down the capital structure to be able to have a seat at the table and figure out with the sponsor what should that capital structure look like. And through a long, very challenging process, we finally figured out that the best way to do it would be to create an OPCO, uh, the operating company, and a PropCO, the, the entity which would hold the properties, uh, the gaming properties, and then lease them back to the OPCO. So that's called Caesars, that's the OPCO, and Beachy is the PropCO. And uh, what we received by holding you know, close to $2 billion market value of debt was a combination of cash, new debt that was worth par, if not uh, higher, and equity. So we're one of the largest holders right now, uh, previously being a creditor in the bankruptcy process. We're one of the largest holders of Caesars and one of the largest holders of Beachy, the PropCo. Now, if you look at th slide 38, here's another example of Mitch, a company. Uh, Mitch, yeah. I want to come back then. Yeah, minute, sure. But just I want to comment here um, that the second lean debt you bought, how low did it trade? 17? It hit, uh, I think it bottomed out at 14, 15, and at the end of the day, it was worth well over par. Okay, so when we talk about debt, once again, I think the point Mitch is making, and before we go to another example, Mitch, I want to just move on for a sec, is that here you had a debt trading at 14, 15 cents in the dollar. You had analyzed what was an unbelievably comp complicated structure, uh, figured out where value was, and at the end of the day, you ended up getting seven times your money uh, on a debt security and getting ownership in the company. That's How many people at your firm worked on that situation? Uh, all told about, I would say, 10. Okay, so <laughs> you're moving through the capital structure and create an opportunity. I'm gonna come back to the second example. George, Think about some situations, you know, people thought Italy was going bankrupt, Greece was going bankrupt, Spain was going to bite the dust. Uh, give us the feeling of what's going on inside your firm uh, as these things are occurring. How are you moving where, you're, where the people in your firm are really on three different continents uh, at the time to try to crystallize the strategy that you deployed? Well, uh, an area I can talk about would be Spain. And Spain we've been active in for a few years. It's interesting that in, in 2017, uh, we invested more money in Spain related to cuspy assets, distressed assets, than we did anywhere else in the world. And I know for a lot of folks, uh, there was a lot of talk about distress in a place like Spain, and, and they would have thought, well, that opportunity must be over. Uh, but what we did to take advantage of that opportunity was, was really uh, built a, a patient approach to Spain uh, where uh, we hired the, the requisite language speakers and the presence uh, on the ground. Uh, and, and then uh, there was a lot of discussion over time and, and our evolution in the country uh, occurred over those several years. And we started out in the more liquid situations. Uh, we ended up buying an asset management firm uh, and eventually, uh, we ended up owning a couple platforms that, that could be used to uh, purchase the assets and really had a barrier to others being able to buy those assets. And so within the firm, the discussion really spread across all three offices. Uh, we did a lot of relative value comparing. We, we thought a lot about uh, the values that we could uh, uh, achieve in Spain versus anywhere else. Uh, and we spent a lot of time looking at the state of home building uh, and the lack of development uh, over the last few years, particularly compared to, say, the U.S. or other markets. Thank you. Uh, Manny, I don't believe I've ever met a person over the years that has more passion when you get an idea. And um, probably one of the things that really defines you to me is I was in New York, we were at an event, and you flew from, uh, came up the train from Washington to talk to me about the article on CRISPR technology, which will be the focus of tomorrow's lunch panel, and the ability to cure a disease from that standpoint. Well, and to destroy the world. 
or to destroy the world which is really the issue we're going to address what is the future of humanity as you listen to some of these sessions you usually have a counter opinion so let's take mitch's little chart there that he threw up on those four boxes uh, what what is your how would you view those things that mitch threw up there before for us to look at so could you see the 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 box about uh, we'll get we'll get the right ones up in a minute i like that uh, 18, slide though 18. <laughs> so uh you know this is a, a complete fallacy uh what you're looking at this is but what i love about manny after <laughs> after i give him a half hour presentation on how the world was formed he lets me know that i was wrong and mitch who is a brilliant investor, uh, is notice it says post-08 financial crisis. This is true in 9, 10, 11. And, but today, it's actually just the opposite. Today, uh, there's $250 billion of excess capital in the banks. They're taking the chains off the banks, so they're beginning to affect the middle market dramatically. You can see every BDC, every small BDC is starting to trade at 60, 70% of book. Yields are being squeezed across the board. So the, we're not yeah, in the I, I, One second, Manny, I just have no, to tell you. No, let me you. just finish. No, I, wait one second. I have to tell you, though, that in the debt, it may be that you see capital in your neck of the woods, but as far as our neck of the wood is, are, are concerned, we're constantly being asked to underwrite debt deals that don't fit into ETF structures. And I understand that Donald Trump and his team are trying to unleash these bank balance sheets. But, you know, that administration is only going to last so long, and they're looking <laughs> beyond that administration to Elizabeth Warren and all the regulations. So, <laughs> We're still seeing, at least in our markets, a tremendous amount of opportunity. So what I'm saying, though, is not that, that it's already over with. I'm saying that it's just beginning, okay. that you're just beginning to see across the board, you know, the opposite of 08. The pendulum that was the 08 disaster is now beginning to swing the other way okay. across the board. And you might not see that for another six months, another year, another two years, but it is happening everywhere at this point. And you will see that continue, which is really one of the major challenges, one of the dangerous areas in, in the United States where the direct lending business is now 16, 18 trillion dollars compared, which is uh, 32 trillion, which is double the size of the bank lending business. But that I is. I mean, many. I mean, I look at Deutsche Bank, which has been totally neutered as a. But Deutsche as Bank's a, a non player in the United but States. But I understand that. But that is a big balance sheet that has been totally downsized. And if you look at Europe uh, also, other banks have just gotten out of the underwriting business and have and gotten into the wealth management business. So all I'm trying to say is, may, you know, you're, it's time frame. No, no, no. What I'm saying is <laughs> that. The pendulum is swinging the other way. It doesn't mean there's not opportunities. In your example of Caesars, it has very, very little to do with the banking industry. It has to do with your brilliance of seeing an opportunity within the Caesars, period. I mean, look at that. Nobody understands that chart. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, they don't. They don't. That's the whole purpose. That's why you can make money. Not because banks can't get involved, because, <laughs> because of the unbelievable complexity I, I tell you one thing, that Manny, give you the advantage. Manny, let me just tell you that in our experience, even after Caesars emerged from Chapter 11, the banks were wanting, in terms of financing, that simplified capital structure. It takes a while for a institution, a company, to go from bankruptcy and then become like investment grade. So in but between, did, today is not 08. Today is not 09. Today is all I know is we lent on a senior secured basis uh, in that period where they just emerged because no bank wanted to do it. So I, I, look, I'm not. I don't want to. Well, let, let's with assume, you, <laughs> I think the point Manny is making here, and 
that we're not going to decide today is where where are we headed? What is the direction we're yeah. heading? Isn't that the point you're making, Manny? Yes. I mean, I, look, there's going to be you know exceptions to the rule. There are going to be uh, openings, but the wide openings you saw, the gigantic openings of 09 are slowly disappearing, are going to disappear over the next four or five years. So I, um, in 1974, we were able to buy bonds for their coupon. Never thought in my <laughs> lifetime it would ever happen. But once again, in late 08, 09, we had bonds paying interest trading for their coupon from that standpoint. Mark, what is the volatility and what competition are you seeing in the mezzanine business today? Well, I think all the businesses are uh, competitive uh, as financing sources. You're talking uh, on the other side of the dais here about uh, direct lending. And, you know, one of the, the points I think, you know, I think we would take the point of view that we're all lending money a lot more responsibly than the banks used to. Um, we've got a couple of slides, by the way, relative to uh, growth on, in the, in the uh, high yield credit in slides 9 and 10 that show that actually corporate debt in or below investment grade universe is coming down as a multiple now. Uh, seven quarters of declining leverage while everybody's waiting for uh, the credit cycle to end. It doesn't seem to uh, be ending. And so uh, there are a number of folks who are trying, trying to crowd into a space where we saw a, a trillion dollars of dry powder in uh, private equity firms. The, the key is uh, how to make it simple. Um, you know, it used to be several tranches of transactions. Now we have uh, this new concept of unit tranche financing. We have just, you know, one debt player and maybe one equity player. Uh, we did those deals back to when we worked with Mike. We used to call it senior unsecured debt. Now it's called unit tranche. But uh, it actually makes things simpler. Uh, you could invest in growth companies like John Donockel's talking about 12 times plus cash flow. You can lend to six, six and a half times cash flow uh, at often with fees, eight plus percent, provide uh, very meaningful returns to investors. and, and uh, I think that's all very positive insofar as things are still growing. Regula regulations are something we all have taken advantage of in this panel uh, in both directions. I think we'll all continue to take advantage of regulatory environment. And, you know, John, I don't know if you're, you know, how you are looking at it. John, I, I'd love you to talk about, you know, how you've transitioned into the type of companies in a portfolio. Mm. So there was a day where a high percentage of the companies you bought were retail, and today there's not a lot that you would be right. first focusing. How have you transitioned? You know, that's sort of the magic. Uh, again, if you're, if you're in it, you know, it's interesting. If I were going to invest in savings, and loan, I give the money to Manny because he's, look, he's done more, he understands it more. We'd done enough retail, we could sort of see the writing on the wall, so we managed to exit that, those investments that uh, would ultimately be impacted by some of the trends we've talked about. Um, we did that two, three, four years ago. Um, it's it's just sort of a, 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 it's a pattern recognition. Are you suggesting you don't want to buy Neiman Marcus back? <laughs> you know that's probably more Mitch's uh, game right now. <laughs> uh, if you look at it, <laughs> I, I, I would like to say, actually make one point though that I thought was interesting listening to the uh, sort of the discussion argument whatever wh whatever that was. Discussion. But uh, <laughs> discussion. one thing that's that that's al that's always strikes me is is fascinating is the disconnect between different markets. So you know I talked earlier about the S and P 500, 25 trillion dollar market, and how it's valued and how it grows. And then and yet before this we had a panel where everybody's complaining about 11 times EBITDA is too much to pay for companies in our world. So a disconnect. Mike, you mentioned a, 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 a phenomenon that I find fascinating, where a bond is um, trading poorly, and then as the risk of default becomes clearer, it moves up. It doesn't make any sense, right? It, 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 obviously, those two markets weren't, weren't talking to each other when, when that came about. 
So, you know, well, let me just let me just mention briefly why it makes sense. You're a creditor. If there's a long running room, yeah. Okay, you might be paying interest to the buys that are junior and you're going out the door. Yeah. I mean, okay, it, once it looks like you're not going to do it anymore, if I'm first, I now have to now analyze, okay, you're going to pay me par or you're going to hand me the keys. Mm -hmm. So there's a potential rationale in that. Potential, for sure. Let me, let me uh, go back to the, the sort of the, un and this is the way we would look at it. I look at Caesars before and the thinking that went into the buyout and without casting um, aspersions on the thinking that went into it. But what's fascinating to me is, you know, we talk a lot about EBITDA. When, when we worked for Mike, there was no such thing as EBITDA. There was EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. EBITDA is a made up number. And it's not, and right now we have an EBITDA and it's pro forma projected, you know, we're talking about those sorts of, we're, we're using those sorts of concepts to rationalize. You, you would also, in your analysis, John, subtract capital expenditures, so you're really looking at cash. Which was exactly the point I was making, I wanted to make, because if you look at, at the notion of gaming, it is not an EBITDA business. You have to spend money to refresh. So that company started Life Crippled. It hit, it hit uh, a downturn, and of course the wheels came off, and because of that, because of a poor decision that was made early on, Mitch was able to feast and make seven times his money because he took the time to go and, and study and study. It's just, it, the, the dynamism of, of these sorts of things is, is um, you know, to me just sort of fascinating as, as you sort of get different people in different markets talking about different things, different valuation parameters. Well, part, part of the reason, John, is because people populate different kinds of investment entities and they have different incentives and decision rules. So they look at it from the, you know, as the old expression, where you stand depends on where you sit. Yeah. So, you know, a guy who has, you know, if you're, uh, for example, Vanguard, that's the product that you promote, right? Even, notwithstanding the fact that you have this reinforcing dysfunctional cycle of, inc of having an index that's market cap weighted right. and every time one of those five stocks, bang stocks goes up, you got to buy more of it, right? So you know it's dysfunctional in some sense when it unwinds, but that's what you sell. If you're in private equity, you know, you look at it from that standpoint. If you do what we do and, you know, you're in the secondary market, you're designing securities, um, you look at it from our standpoint, George's standpoint. We, so the, the key to good governance, though, is checks and balances so that you don't take an institution's money and basically put it to work based on the sole mandate that you have without regard to what's happening in the, in the environment. I mean, that's what the staying power element is. Mm -hmm. George? So <clears throat> could you just pull up slide 69? I think this just kind of follows on with uh, what Mitch was talking about. And this just sh shows the, the growth in, in ETFs in, in one way, and of course a lot of that uh, it, it holds uh, bonds, debt instruments. And, and these ETFs actually uh, own uh, our inventory, okay, or our raw material for our business. They don't know it. Uh, <laughs> but at, at some point in time, they're going to face an uneconomic decision because there's the, the flows will reverse. They're going right. to flow out. And then when they sell those bonds, I mean, they're smart people running them, but they're facing a whole different set of perspectives. And as that paper flows out, of course, it creates an opportunity to, to buy this debt because uh, critical to our business is, is buying it right. And it's the, the ETFs, uh, you know, I certainly uh, would like to, you know, use them as a benchmark for my investing because I think they are going to face those outflows. But the higher those ETFs go, the more at some point active investing becomes unbelievably profitable. We already see it in the REIT area starting, where ETFs now are 60, 65% of every single transaction. So when you, we just saw this with a company we bought into, Alexander Baldwin, once we got it into the REIT index, 65% uh, uh, had to be bought of the entire market cap. So what happens when it hits 90%? What happens when it ha hits 99%? There is a point where it no, it's, it's such an aberration, it doesn't work. Right. It's like, if everyone knows what the future is going to happen in the market tomorrow morning, all, all of us on this, in this room, it's impossible that 
what is supposed to happen is going to happen because we're going to anticipate. And the same thing with ETFs. I'm, I just want to last out until they hit 90 percent, 95 percent, and we'll make a fortune. <laughs> That's it. Don't disagree. Agree. All right. So well, I we think can agree on that. One. Agree on that. <laughs> I think one of the things you see here is we have uncommon investors, but they have tested time. If we pull up slide 77, for example, in closing here, we've spanned w wide ranges here of financial markets. And so when we look at and say interest rates are going up relative to what period of time yeah. are, are we talking about from that standpoint? And I think you can see whether it's the passion in Mitch and Manny or <laughs> George or John or Mark today, that it's both a passion but an appreciation for experience gleamed in markets over a long period of time. I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. Yeah, really, really.